So this is the parallel axis theorem. Um, what's the basic idea? Yesterday we talked about how to get the moment of inertia of like uh, just a... What's the moment of inertia of a mass around an axis? Just a point <laughs> mass. This is mr squared, right? And then how did we derive the moment of inertia of a stick around its edge? Like, you take a stick like this, you stick it on one end, you pin it at one end, and what's the moment of inertia? How do you get the moment of inertia of the stick? It's one-third ml squared, but how did you derive that? You had to integrate from here to here, integrate all those individual point masses, right? <coughs> okay, so what if I said, I want you to determine the moment of inertia about the center? What would you do? Same, same process, right? Two sticks from here to here and add it to the moment of inertia from here to here. Or what else could you do if you didn't want to, in, to do it twice? You just integral great from one end of the stick to the other end of the stick, right? All right. Yeah. Right? Because you just set that is like negative L over 2 to L over 2. Right? You should be able to, right? Does that make sense? Because it's just going to be the radius squared, so the fact that it's negative doesn't matter. Because that negative 5 gets squared and becomes 25, just like positive 5 does. Right? Good? Okay. There's actually an easier way. What if I wanted to figure out the moment of inertia about this axis, where it's like a quarter of the way to the end? You integrate from here to here. But what if I told you, if you know the moment of inertia about the end, you can get the answer to the moment of inertia about any spot on here without any work whatsoever. Would you be happy? I or without any integration? Witchcraft. witchcraft, exactly. That's what we're going to do today. It's called the parallel axis theorem. All right. So, here's the idea. The moment of inertia about the new axis of rotation equals the moment of inertia about the center of mass plus md squared. What's m? You... Wait, if you're mo rotating a different... You mean about a different axis? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the parallel axis there. So it does work, right. You have to keep it, if you're rotating, a, a, with, if you're rotating with respect to the z-axis, you your new axis has to still be in the z-direction, right? You can't use the parallel axis theorem to say, okay, um, so I know the moment of inertia of my notebook about its center of mass this way. It won't let you determine the moment of inertia about the corner this way diagonally, right? It doesn't work like that, all right? The axes need to be parallel, right? So about the center of mass versus about the corner, those are two parallel axes. Got it? Parallel axes. All right, so um, here's, the, here's the, uh, the, the whole of it. All you have to do is take the moment of inertia about the center of mass plus the mass of the object times the distance from the center of mass to the new axis of rotation. Done. That's it. No integration required. So once you know one moment of inertia about the center of mass, it's really easy to figure out the moment of inertia about any other axis that's parallel. Does that make sense? So, I have a little proof here, which I don't know how important it is for you to know, but if you're curious, 
Uh, there it is. Actually, I'm going to skip and just give you a chance to work. But I do want to point this one out. Show that if you have the moment of inertia, show that the moment of inertia for a rod pivoting about its end, uh, if you already know that's one third ml squared, wait, no, sorry. Show that it's one third ml squared if you're given that the moment of inertia about the middle is one twelfth ml squared. All right, which we didn't derive yesterday, but we probably should have. All right, so here we go. Moment of inertia about the end is equal to the moment of inertia about the middle plus md squared. So 1 12th ml squared plus m plus d is uh, from here to here is l over 2, so l over 2 squared. So 1 12th ml squared plus 1 quarter ml squared makes one-third ml squared, and that's it. Or likewise, if you knew that it was one-third ml squared about the end, how do you figure out it about the middle? Subtract. Does that make sense? So a lot of the th problems in your packet are like this. You already derived the one for one location. Now you just need to shift the axis of rotation over and derive the new one. Good? All right, cool. Um, so what if you wanted to say, for example, you were working on, you were working in the movie industry and you were doing, uh, CGI and you wanted to make a model of a person, right? And the model of the person that you drew looked like this. And let's uh, say you wanted to know the moment of inertia of this person as they spun around. How would you do that? How would you do the moment of inertia of this little cute little stick figure here? It's actually a three-dimensional solid figure, but made up of a sphere and a couple of blocks. Yeah, what would you do? Right, so all you have to do is you've got a sphere about its center, which you don't know how to do. It's the extra credit one. Then you've got a cylinder about its center, which you're going to find out because that's not an extra credit one. And then you've got another cylinder, this leg right here, but it's not about its center. How do you deal with that? You, you just take a cylinder and then offset it using the parallel axis theorem by however much it is. Then you do the same thing for this leg, right? And then this is just a stick about its end, and this is just a stick about its end, except you go a little bit past the end and shift it over with parallel axis theorem. So the parallel axis theorem allows you to find solid bodies that are off axis or off center, and you'll see this in your homework. Yes? But don't people not have Sure, this is a super simple model. I mean, do you actually look like this? No. Oh, right. <laughs> so, so <laughs> if, you, if you wanted to make a better model, uh, what would you do? S split it up into smaller chunks. Yeah. Right? That's all you have to do. Smaller pieces, and, and, then, and then do more computations. Yeah. Oh, so you're saying non-uniform density? Yeah. So what you do is you, you build a model of yourself. It's called a finite element model. All right? You split yourself into 100 pieces and find the total contribution of no moment of inertia of each of those 100 pieces. How accurate is that going to be? Still not I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. If you wanted a more accurate simulation of your own moment of inertia, how many pieces would you split yourself up into? A thousand. thousand, or a million, or a billion, right? The more pieces you split yourself up into, the more pieces you individually calculate the moment of inertia for, the more accurate of a simulation of your own moment of inertia that you would have. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's exactly like Riemann sums. 
Yeah, physics-based game. So how do they do it? Well, um, I'm working on one right now uh, using a thing called Box2D. And what they do is you just split everything up into either circles, rectangles, or triangles. Right? And depending on how slow you want, how slow and accurate you want the computer to run, right? Because there's a trade off there. You can make a super accurate one, but it's totally unplayable because it's so slow. Right? Unless you have like a really high powered system. Right. Exactly. Which is why computers from my day, back in the day, you know, cool looking was like a couple triangles like turning around on the screen. You're like, oh, look at that. <laughs> and now it's like you're not impressed unless there's like five million triangles on the screen. And they're so small you can't even tell they're triangles. It just looks like smooth curves. All right, so that's it.